Good morning. It's Reverend Mike Capron from the First Presbyterian Church of Elmwood Park. Our text for the morning is 1 John 1, uh, verse 1 through chapter 2, verse 2. Here we go. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, and we have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light, in him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his son purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin, but if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. This ends our reading. Now, as we said last week, we are starting a sermon series on the great ends of the church from our Presbyterian Book of Order. And when we talk about uh, the church, we need to distinguish between capital C church, the church universal, the entire church of Jesus Christ throughout the globe, and small C church, each congregation like this one, which is kind of a branch office, if you will, of the church universal. Let's take a moment and also review what an end is, as in great end. It's kind of a goal or a mark of success or an identifying characteristic. Really, it is fulfilling your purpose. If you're a company, one of your major ends is making a profit. If you're a military unit, one of your major ends is to the ability to win battles. If you are an artist, your primary end is beautiful works of art. But there are multiple ends. Companies want customer satisfaction and high employee morale. Artists want to learn a living. Any type of organization has multiple ends. Our book of order lists six for the church. The proclamation of the gospel for the salvation of humankind, the shelter, nurture, and spiritual fellowship of the children of God, the maintenance of divine worship, the preservation of the truth, the promotion of social righteousness, and the exhibition of the kingdom of heaven to the world. In other words, if you have those six things going on, then you know you have a successful and true church, a good branch office. We are looking uh, today at, or, or every week, we're going to look at one of those six great ends, starting today with the proclamation of the gospel for the salvation of humankind. I'm going to repeat that to let it sink in. The proclamation of the gospel for the salvation of humankind. There are four major words in there. Humankind is easy. It's us. Salvation has to do with being saved from something. Frankly, what we need to be saved from is ourselves, all the ugly, foolish, cruel parts within us that we desperately wish we would, would go away, all the sins we commit. Ultimately, those things can go away, but they must be taken from us by a Savior. Jesus Christ can do that, is willing to do that for us. That's the gospel, the good news. But I think that the key word of this end, the subject, is surely proclamation. We in the church are to proclaim the gospel for the salvation of humankind. 
But how is the church to do that? Perhaps we need to train the best proclaimers we can find. We need to establish outstanding seminaries to attract the best and brightest students. We will steep them in the history of our faith and train them to be the best preachers and evangelists anywhere. We will raise up more Spurgeons, Calvins, and Billy Grahams, and they will proclaim the gospel for the salvation of humankind. Is that really the way to do it? Well, yes, it is, but it's not enough. Frankly, education is something we Presbyterians do very well. We may be proud of our eight seminaries and the many important books from Westminster John Knox Publishing. We Presbyterians have had and do have an impact on Christianity around the world, well out of proportion to our numbers, and we may be proud of that indeed. But it isn't enough to train up a few experts and then sit back and watch them go. The church as a whole is to proclaim the gospel for the salvation of humankind. Yes, professional ordained ministers such as myself have a special role to play, but our ministry does not eliminate or supersede your ministry. And if you are to proclaim the gospel for the salvation of humankind, you must first know the gospel. Furthermore, you must know it in two ways. It doesn't matter which one comes first, but ultimately you must know the good news in both your head and your heart. With regard to head knowledge, doctrine, there are many good summaries. The Apostles' Creed is one good one. The book of 1 John is another, especially the verses we read this morning. The life appeared. We have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim to you eternal life, which which was with the Father and appeared to us, we're talking about Jesus, we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. My dear children, I write this to you so you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but for the sins of the whole world. It isn't necessary that you understand every nuance and have all the answers to every possible question that might arise. Lord knows I certainly don't. But you ought to know some things about the faith and our doctrine, and you ought to have open ears and open eyes to learn more over time to become better and better disciples. But head knowledge is never enough. Heart knowledge is far more important, or perhaps I should call it soul knowledge. This is well illustrated by the story of the 10 lepers in Luke 17, 11 through 19. Listen. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten lepers approached him. Keeping their distance, they called out, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were made clean. Their disease was cured. And one of them when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, were not ten made clean? But the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. These lepers probably didn't have complete knowledge of who Jesus was, but they knew enough to cry out to him when he approached, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. They recognized Jesus. They hoped in Jesus. They knew they needed help, and sometimes that is the hardest part. They had faith that Jesus could and would help them. And despite the fact that they were lepers and considered unclean, condemned to live in isolation and seclusion, and might generally be referred to as gross, uh, Jesus went to them and helped them. This is not the first kind 
No, this is the first kind of heart knowledge we need to have about Jesus, that he will not reject us no matter what we have done, what our appearance is, what other th people think about us, or for any other reason. Nor will he reject anyone else for any of those reasons. That's a big part of the good news that we are privileged to proclaim. Then Jesus told the lepers to go show themselves to the priest. Knowing why takes some head knowledge. That was the prescribed thing to do way back in Leviticus when one was cured of a skin disease. It was the proper thing to do, the traditional thing to do. The nine who kept going to the priest after they were cured did what was correct. They did their duty. But the one who came back had heart knowledge. It was bursting out of him as he praised God and threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him over and over again. This is heart knowledge, a deep-seated gratitude welling up inside a person for the wonderful things that God has done. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. This is a contagious kind of knowledge that spreads from heart to heart and soul to soul. The former leper's feelings of joy and gratitude were a powerful proclamation of the good news for the God, salvation of humankind. This kind of soulful, joyful sharing is truly one of the great ends of the church. Now, where there are ends, there are also means. And the means for proclaiming the gospel for the salvation of humankind come mostly from God. God revealed the words of Holy Scripture for our head knowledge, and God provides the miracles and the love for the heart knowledge. But the church must supply a few of these means as well. We must have preaching and Bible study to help with the head knowledge. And we must help people discern what God is doing in their lives and learn to share it. That's hard. And we must practice on each other until it becomes natural and easy to share about the good things God has done for us. There's an old saying about preaching to the choir, which might lead us to think there's no point in talking about faith in the church. But on the contrary, we must say it here so often that it becomes natural to say it out there. It takes some discipline to do this, especially if we're a bit shy. But if we become aware of Christ's love for us, if we become aware of the way God is moving throughout our lives, then all we have to do is share that good news, just like we would something our child or grandchild did, or if our spouse gave us some wonderful gift, we just speak about the wonder of God as we see it in our lives. That's the general answer, the answer that applies to all congregations in a church universal. But each and every church has its own unique situation, and ours is more unusual than most. Here in Elmwood Park, we are embarking on a journey toward closing as a congregation in November. I wonder if it is really sunk in that this, too, is a manner of proclaiming the gospel for the salvation of humankind. We are staring at the end of a beloved institution. We're kind of staring death in the face, frankly. Of course, it brings a tear to our eye and some butterflies to our stomachs. Uh, mine too. Uh, but we are proclaiming that the gospel is not dependent on any building or branch office. We are proclaiming something that was deeply important to the founders of this church, that Jesus never fails. Our church histories tell us that they proclaim this truth often. I think it was their watchword. And it's important for us to repeat it too. Because our best proclamation does not come when everything is easy. Our best proclamation comes when things are hard, and yet we keep the faith. That is why the message of the cross is so potent. Our salvation came through Jesus' death on the cross. And my friends, Jesus never fails. So keep the faith. Remember the gospel and your own salvation. Proclaim it for the salvation of humankind. Proclaim it with your words and with your actions as we continue this journey together. For Jesus never fails. Amen.